Hey everyone, this is going to be a very, very long one for my standards, and I don't want to waste anyone's time. I want to get right into this. There's just one thing. Before I do, and no, it's not asking you to like and subscribe, it's emphasis on this message from Dana and Amphibia creator Matt. So, just to make things clear, I'm not going to judge the show on what could have been, for the most part, and instead on what it is. Both in terms of the positives and its faults, I'm not just going to lump everything on Disney. Anything less, I feel, would be a disrespect to the show and its creators behind it. With that out of the way, there's really nothing more I want to say, let's get started shall we? Woo! Honestly, there's definitely an argument for witches before wizards not being at the very bottom of the list. And, as is the same for pretty much all of even the lowest episodes, there are still some good parts of it. To be specific, the ending. Where we first see the boiling aisles for what it really is, one of the most hardcore settings in media. And the little talk between Ida and Luz about how we have to make our own path instead of believing we're chosen is really nice, and actually fits in very nicely to the finale. And there's also the scene that works quite well with Lucy's arc about the potential of a real fantasy life instead of being bullied in the more realistic world. So there is good stuff that still makes it required watching for any new viewer. If I made a tier list for this series, even the lowest tier would just be okay episodes. The problem is... Well, the main great scene I mentioned is the last 30 seconds of the episode, give or take. And the other 20 minutes are just, well, aren't that great. Seeing Luz delivering potions isn't very enthralling, there's a reason we never see it again. And then, well, there's the fake wizard and the quest. Look, I know it's supposed to be generic, I know that's the point, but it's just not funny enough and not creepy enough, to the point where you're just kind of sat waiting for Luz to find out it's not real, what a shocker. The only other upside this episode has is that it's pretty funny when it wants to be, and it's nice to see more budding seeds of this found family grow, but it's not quite enough to save this episode from the bottom of the barrel. Witches Before Wizards is the closest the show gets to quote unquote boring, and was probably the closest I got to dropping it. Now, this episode I've already gone over in a lot of detail, actually, in a semi-recent video. So, if you want to know my more detailed thoughts on why I think the Owl House's very first episode missed the mark, go have a watch of that. And then, come back to this pretty please. But to TLDR, a combination of really strange writing decisions, very forced thematic messages, slow and clumsy comedy, and no real hook to get your attention and make you want to keep watching, is what keeps a lying witch and a warden so low. So yeah, that's the first two episodes in the single lowest ones on this list. To say the Owl House gets off on a rocky start is a bit of an understatement. But to anyone watching it, I say this. Keep going, it's worth it. Let them cook. Okay, first of all, did anyone else think that the demon hunters, specifically this guy, were going to be way more important to the overall story than they ended up being? Or at least more than the one-off baddie. I bet you completely forgot they existed, didn't you? The episode lands squarely in the area of just okay. I appreciate the big ol' shout out to Baba Yaga in the form of the walking owl house, and the foreshadowing of these three being some of the strongest, most skilled witches on the isles is actually pretty cool. But there's really not much meat on the bone when it comes to what's actually featured here. On one side we have a going against the bullies story where they never properly interact with the bullies that turns into a very forgettable fight with a very forgettable antagonist, and on the other side you have Tibbles, who, I mean, there's a reason even the show started to turn towards the fact that he's an annoying, unlikable character, and not unlikable in the good way. 
and this first episode is a big reason why. He's not threatening, he's not funny, he's not charismatic, he's not even that hateable to the point where you can be too happy when his stall is smashed. Yeah, uh, there's not really much else to say about this one. Favourite line goes to Luz's genuine anger here. Ah, here we are. The big one. I'm not gonna lie. When I finally caught up with the Owl House and got into the fandom side of things, I was kinda shocked to find that Once Upon a Swap was generally seen as the worst, most disliked episode. I mean, I suppose I can see where it comes from, and it's not like I have it particularly high, it's still in the bottom five. For one, it really goes out of its way to emphasise how nonsensical Ida's business is. Like, apparently she doesn't want to be noticed by any authorities, but she's always casually walking around and out in the open, often making a big deal of herself. And yes, it doesn't advance the plot or push forward any big character arcs, so you could technically define it as the new flanderized version of the word filler. But you know what? I can look past that, because there is some great stuff in here. For one, it's really good to see our main trio just messing around and having fun, something that is few and far between after season one. Ida's part of the tale is by far the least interesting, at least to me, but it's made up for by the other two. Teenage King is an absolute delight, oh my god. I wouldn't go as far to say he carries the episode, but he almost does. Luz as Ida is a riot as well, even if that face is just a little uncanny. And it does bring up the question of how wild magic actually works, does she need to, like, just think about anything she wants? The show purposefully goes out of its way to not explain this multiple times, and it's a shame because so much of this lore is so interesting and fun. So yeah, I'm aware that Once Upon a Swap is not the greatest episode, but long story short, does it deserve all the ridicule thrown at it by the fanbase over the years? The answer is… a little. But it's not entirely irredeemable. And if you watch it for what it is, a harmless piece of fluff back when times were simpler for the Owl House, you'll have a very good time. Sense and Insensitivity isn't that bad in episodes. It's a good bit of fun, and in the grand scheme of things, it does add to the series as a whole when you're first watching it. By building upon Lucy's and King's relationship, and it does have its moments of deeper greatness, with the conversation between Ida and Lilith at the end being the primary example. It's a great early look into the more complex character that is Ida's sister. Now that being said, it's as low as it is for a reason. The rest of the episode just isn't great. Until the very, very end, Ida and Lilith's whole subplot feels just kind of meandering. It's basically the kind of thing that, again, the new bastardization of the word filler has emerged from. It feels like padding, because we can't have a big confrontation between these two yet, so let's have them chase some random magical immortality flower. Yeah, sure, why not? It's not like it, or what should be more important, Ida's uncertainty about her age ever comes back. The Losing King part is actually a lot stronger. I really like the segment of them just writing a book together. It's a super sweet sequence, and it's nice to see them getting some brother-sister bonding in. They're the heart of the episode, and while I do think it falters pretty heavily with the villain of the week publisher, like, there's really not much to say about this guy, the heart with these main two is more than enough to keep me watching. Even this far down, I'd say we've passed the level of okay, and are now at the level of fun, good episodes. Man, do I feel sorry for Gus in this show. Like, if getting the short end of the stick was a competition, this little guy would be bringing home the gold every day of the week. In his first ever episode with actual focus on him, you know what he gets? A liar reveal plot line, everyone's favourite, not at all tired and predictable trope. Yeah, the, the Gus part of the Gus episode is sadly the weakest aspect. I honestly think the Human Appreciation Society could be a genuinely interesting and really fun idea, but it just exists for 
ha ha silly witches don't understand human objects jokes again and again and again, which we already have with Ida. Then there's Matholomule, which, I mean, we'll get into him more later, but he's one of the characters where the show, both before and after the cancellation, never really seemed to know quite what to do with. Luz and Ida are the best part of the episode by far. The latter especially, it's both hilarious to see her back at the school where she was the local terror, having to fix up her past crimes, and it's also really heartwarming, seeing her work so hard for the human that she's now quite attached to. We needed as much emotional connection as we can get between the two before the big season finale, and ironically, despite the fact that they're not interacting here, this is probably one of the best instances of it. And hey, we get more time with Bump, who's a really wholesome character that I wish was able to contribute more to the story. I say wholesome, but oh my god, what is going on with the school in detention? Because this is a major red flags. Ida, you might be right about this. Yeah, really small problems as an episode that I'm pretty sure most people expected to be in the bottom three. I'd say it's probably up there with Once Upon a Swap as the most disliked episode in the fandom. And I can certainly see why. It's a Tibbles episode, for God's sake. And the characters can seem overly cruel to King in sections, which is somewhat out of character for one or two of them, even if they've barely interacted before now. Now, subjectively, I can really emphasise with King's issues about feeling left out from a friend group, despite, you know, actively hanging out with them. It's a strong emotion that I do really resonate with, even if it is at the expense of some slight character inconsistency. But even then, disregarding that, there are some really good parts. King's fear of Luz being gone is heartbreaking every time it appears, and this is no exception. It's the proper beginning of one of the best show-long arcs of someone who, for the vast majority of season 1, you could definitely assume to be just the comedic role of the show. Speaking of comedy, when I went back to rewatch this episode, I didn't expect it to be so fucking funny, oh my god! I'm sorry, but Ida's side story is amazing. Not because it's deeper character building or anything, but because it never comes close to overstaying its welcome. And when it's on screen, I can't help but start giggling like an absolute idiot whenever I see the fun police. My sense of humour is really broken, huh? Willow and Gus don't really have any moments to shine, season 1A, eh, take a shot. But oddly enough, Tibbles is probably at his best in this episode, by far. It's Tibbles, so it's a bar that's firmly in the Mariana Trench. But he actually crosses the line here from annoying to all the way past tolerable and straight into fairly entertaining. Good for him. Ah, Escape of the Palisman. This one is definitely a mixed bag. Ida and King's side of the story isn't too much to write home about until the very end, which seems to be a pattern that's developing here. The reveal that Ida's elixir is no longer working is some great setup for the finale, and the reason for the viewer to be interested to see what happens next, which, even at this point in season 1, is needed a decent amount. But of course, the focus of this episode is on Luz and Willow and Gus, and of course, Albert and the Bat Queen. And our precious owl boy rarely ever gets some focus, so it's really nice at this point to get some lore on what, you know, he actually is. The Palisman are a super fun concept, and the show knows it, which is why they get such a focus in the second and third seasons. However, the majority of this part of the episode is mostly focused on completing Mario Party-esque minigames tasks for the Bat Queen, and all this ends up being is just build up for the genuinely good plot twist that the Bat Queen herself is actually a Palisman, which, you know, raises a lot of questions about Palisman because apparently they can reproduce, or unless the Bat Queen is a special Palisman, but we're never gonna find that out because the Bat Queen's past and mysterious owner are famously one of the only completely unresolved mystery plot points of the entire show. The most common fan theory seems to be the Titan, but like, no, 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 she would need to be a thousand times the size. So while the episode isn't necessarily bad, it's just leading up to a revelation just begging to be built upon that never happens. It's a shame, maybe one day we'll find out in a Gravity Falls or Avatar comic style follow up. Here's open.
in Season 1, Episode 3 of The Owl House, Luz is clearly shocked when Ida mentions there is a magic school. However, Ida clearly mentioned the existence of a magic school in the episode before. Boy, I hope someone got fired over that error. I greatly apologize f for that, whatever that was. I was a teenage abomination, it's a lot of fun, it's both a very revisitable episode and one that's a great step up on first watch. With the introduction of Willow and Gus, it's great to see Luz interacting with characters that, how do I put it, aren't trying so hard to be the dry, jaded wit to her unsolvable enthusiasm. And the introduction of the rest of the Hexide Squad, by that I mean Amity, oh dang this is the first episode in the list with Amity. I mean, I've got a lot of words for Amity, mostly good ones, but now is not the time for them. For now, the most I'll say is that she's especially fun to go back to after the finale, to see her so incredibly infuriated by the human, knowing what happens between these two. Obviously, every good rivals to friends slash lovers story needs to start out with a good rivalry, and while Teenage Abomination is, as you can tell, probably the least interesting Amity episode, it was absolutely a necessary starting point. Let's see, uh, what else is there? Ada and King's B-plot really isn't much to write home about besides a couple of funny moments, and the Academy security system, oddly enough, feels like it could be a lead-up to glyphs in the way that it looks, but never gets mentioned again. Willow and Gus shine pretty well as characters in this episode, and the former's problem about being pushed into a track that's less comfortable for you because it has better job opportunities uh, feels pretty relevant to today. Hexide episodes can be very hit or miss, and this one's a fairly solid hit. Before anything else, I just want to say, I feel you, Ida, I feel you. Chicks are not my strong point. No, no, thank you very much. This episode introduces us to Amity's twin siblings, and while it's not like they're on anyone's top 5 favourite characters, I think, Blight stands let me know, but at the same time, everyone likes them well enough, and the exact same can be said for this episode. It's a good time, but there's nothing about it that sticks out in comparison to so, so many of the ones above it. I do really like the creativity when it comes to the Demon Realm library, both before but especially after it comes to life. It's a great little sequence, and in a bit of a reverse for an episode with Amity, instead of her getting closer to Luz, it's kind of the other way around, with her and us learning a good bit more about Miss Cotton Candy here. We get some more depth to Amity here, a little scry into what her life is like outside of Hexite, and as it turns out, she can be pretty cool. I can't tell you how glad I am that they don't have Amity immediately start crushing on Luz, it feels so much more natural like this. A slow build. Oh, and there's the Bat Queen, as we already mentioned. She really does like to leave things hanging, doesn't she? This is her second out of three major appearances, and every single time she ends up leaving with some kind of hint as for why she's appearing again, which this is the only time it gets resolved. I'm sorry, but that's kind of hilarious. All in all, a good little episode, but yeah, there's really not much else to write home about. Yeah, I know, right? A Lumity episode reaching this low. Okay, okay, but really, let me explain. Firstly, the B-plot with King is really just harmless fluff. There's nothing too much to talk about other than the fact that it's funny. Again, take a shot. And I believe, for the first time, Hootie gets more than just a cameo or two in an episode. So, I guess points for that, but that's really about it. Obviously, the meat and potatoes of this episode comes from Luz, Ida, Amity and the twins. And personally, I find it to be... a mixed bag. Training wands are an interesting concept that just never get brought up again. I know, I know, the glyphs, but still. And personally, I think Ida's goofiness is a little dialed up to 11 here. To the point where you, uh... do really start to question a little how good of a mentor she actually is. Because yes, she does point loose in the right direction, but it ends up feeling less like she's a wise, powerful witch, and more like she just got completely lucky. Because she had no idea about the glyphs, okay? She was trying to teach Luz how she would teach a normal witch. Which, <laughs> clearly isn't the way to go about things. Who knows, maybe I'm overthinking this. 
Now, the finale of the episode isn't too much to talk about. It's a fairly forgettable battle against a big roaring monster, but I do think the uh, conclusion of Amity's arc here, question mark, is unintentionally hilarious. I can't do magic! Yes, you can! Wait, you're right, yes I can. That being said, there's a reason why the episode is as high as it is. Because of that scene where Luz discovers the ice cliff was already an incredibly stellar scene, but I think the show's ending just boosted it up to one of the best scenes of season one. The music, the voice acting, the realisation of what the future means on your first time around, and the knowledge of the Titan looking down on her on repeat viewings. The scene pretty much carries the episode for me. Well, that and Luz and Amity. They're adorable, okay? They have great chemistry and build up, and it's sweet seeing her really start to care about this human. Praise be the limity. Full disclosure, this episode used to be a lot lower. Like, bottom five lower. Before I rewatched this series for the video, the most I remembered from this episode was that it was yet another stupid lie reveal plot. And going back to it, Oh yes, that is absolutely the low light of the episode. It makes even less sense than Gussie's. So, losing the detention squad fall out because her friends call out about the detention track being crap. But the detention track not being crap is supposed to be a massive secret. So what the hell, guys? It's a really forced split, and it does drag the episode down. The good news is, the rest of the episode is actually pretty stellar. In fact, this episode is, stealthily, one of the most important episodes of Season 1, I'd argue. Not only do we get Luz rebelling against the Coven system in her own unique way, but we also get the whole idea of shape-shifting basilisks set up, which, you know, is a major player in some of the best episodes in the entire series. And what it has in lore and setup, it equally has in comedy. I have admittedly been ragging on most of King's B-plots so far in this video, and technically his appearance in this episode is no different. It doesn't advance the plot, or the characters, or the world, it's just King goofing around. The difference here is that it's actually pretty goddamn hilarious. I wish I'd been talked by the King of Teachers, you go man! Wow, okay, we're at number 31, and we're already out of episodes that I'd consider average. <laughs> this is gonna be a long one. This was apparently the first episode to be made with the knowledge that the show was to be shortened, and it shows, if only at the ending, because Bellos and his plans, so shrouded in mystique, needed a good old kick to at least get a little move in motion. Now, I used to have this episode a good amount further down, just because I remembered very little about it. But honestly, I like pretty much all of what Follies has to offer. Kikimura is certainly an interesting choice to centre an episode around, but the fact that not every antagonist is redeemable, even besides Belos, is actually a really nice touch. Because, yeah, some people are just scumbags who will walk all over you no matter how much you try to help them out. But honestly, this just makes me appreciate her character a lot more had she just been another person, which... demon? Purely manipulated by Belos. Then there's our heroes, and honestly all of them are great here. Ida and Rain? I actually love how upon rewatch, it's pretty clear that Rain isn't being controlled by Terra like how we first think. Heck, there's even a little moment of him whistling into the drink to nullify it, like how we find out a few episodes later, that's awesome! Then there's Luz and Amity being adorable, not much else to say there, Hootie being a goddamn riot, and even Willow gets a pretty great scene, being able to casually show how she's no longer the for lack of better term, pushover she was in most of season 1. There's no massive standout moments, except maybe Luz freaking out over what her mother had said, at least by the standards of season 2, but Follies at the Coven Day Parade is undoubtedly really solid, good on it. Convention does a lot of good things. It introduces us properly to yet another main aspect of the Owl House's fascinating lore and magic system, the Covens. Like I said, I'm trying my hardest to not use the excuse of the show being shortened for its flaws, but here is a genuine example of that, I think. I would really have loved to see the intricacies of these and the Coven heads expanded upon in more detail, but there just wasn't time for that. 
What we also get is Lilith, who makes for both by far the episode's highlight, as well as the strangest low point in the grand scheme of things. Let me explain. Highlights should be obvious, her battle with Ida is absolutely spectacular, and the first proper showcase of just how incredible the animation for the Owl House can be. And the low point, well, she's the mentor of Amity, which is fine in the vacuum of this episode, but like, never gets expanded upon? At all? Why was this even included? Why was this a thing? Speaking of whom, it is great to see Amity and Luz's relationship start to blossom as she gains respect for the human. Enemies to friends slash lovers does feel dime a dozen these days in terms of animation, but this one is done really well, even in the early days, and was honestly the main thing keeping me invested throughout season 1. Besides certain specific episodes, but we'll get there, eventually. This, or maybe the last episode, 50-50, is probably the tier where episodes go from good, because yes, I wouldn't say there's a single bad episode in the Owl House, to really good. Speaking of which, wing it like witches. Well, it's less here because of what it is as a whole, and more because of the sum of its parts. What I mean by that is, the episode as a whole is really nothing to write home about. It's just a big sporting match against a pretty typical bully character and Ida and Lilith having one last confrontation before things get serious, in a way that really, really does not feel like one last confrontation before things get serious. However, what makes this episode stand out is its moments. Like, we'll discuss it more in a moment, but understanding Willow is where I feel the show finally found its stride when it comes to writing. And just two episodes later, that really shows here. Because this episode is, like, Really freaking funny! Gus has some great lines, the whole montage bit, the call out to Harry Potter, and so much more. But, of course, the episode's highlight beyond a shadow of a doubt is Gay Panic Amity. I was not around for it when the episode was first out, but I can only imagine the absolute cataclysm that this must have brought to the fanbase, in a good way I mean. Like, there's a reason these lines are some of the most famous in the show two seasons later. Like I said, its parts are better than its whole, but I can't argue any more than that about Wing It Like Witches. Ah, the knee pats of gay panic. Wonderful stuff. Escaping Expulsion is a strange episode to me, because, well, I should love it. I should like it way more than I do. Which, I mean, it's not like I dislike it, not at all. I think it's a dang solid episode, but for some reason I just can't get myself too hyped about it. Now, like I said, there's some really great stuff in here. We finally get some reciprocation from the Lou side of Lumity. Took you long enough, you oblivious little scrunkle. And of course, this episode has some really necessary world building for the second half of the show, with the Abomination mechs popping up decently often. But going back to Amity and Luz for a second, the episode's highlight is of course the battle with the new Abomatron. It's emotional, it's awesome, it's sweet, and it's very funny when it wants to be. It's the reason this episode is remembered, and no wonder. However, my second favourite part of the episode has to be the Ida and Lilith section. There's the comedic side of it of course, which is very good, but honestly, it's more the glyph system itself that really caught my attention. For a show about magic, we really went a whole season without a proper magic system, but the glyphs and how they work and why they work add a whole new dimension to the battles and I love it! Now there are some lowlights. Odalia is a very one dimensional character, and only really interesting at all as a foil to Amity, especially when the stakes are lower. And Willow and Gus are written out by being grabbed by basic abominations like Come on, they could take these guys out with ease a season ago. It's a good episode, a really good episode, but I'm afraid to say it just doesn't grab me like those above it. Go figure. To best sum up my thoughts on The Owl House Season 3, I believe this image should be the best visual indicator I can manage. Yeah, that's about right. Now, of course, I don't think this episode is a bad one. It could be much further down, 
is it a little disappointing that it doesn't nearly measure up to the other two installments of season 3? Yes, but it does have its strengths. Take the first few minutes. The intro is probably one of my favourite scenes of the entire show. In large part because, oh my god, they did not need to go so hard with a score in this moment. The Collector showing off more of his power in ways equally terrifying, okay maybe terrifying isn't the right word, and hilarious ways. Rain's reaction to Ida, the animation, the mysterious setup afterwards, stellar stuff. And throughout the entire episode, our main heroes are actually treated really well in terms of their characters. The Hex Squad has been beaten down and you can see that all of them are weary and tired. Despite the overly childish imagery throughout, the downtrodden attitudes of our cast really help solidify the episode as being one of the entries in the show's big climax. Luz I will get to in a moment, it's really interesting to see King have to take the voice of reason for a more childish figure for once, Amity and Gus are just really solid, Willow is, after shouldering the burden of the team for so long, is finally able to release her emotions, and Hunter, oh my god is this the first episode here with Hunter in it? How many episodes have we gone through so far, like 20? I guess he's just that basic character! I guess we do have our Hunt low confirmation, which, I mean, I was rather happy with, but I think I'll save that talk for another episode because there is so much to talk about here. For example, now seems as good a time as any to talk about the enigma that is The Collector. I've mentioned before this, I'm afraid I'm still going to stick with it, The Collector's shift to being goofy and completely oblivious to the damage he causes, while being an interesting character concept, does not line up with the character we've seen throughout the last season. I'm not even talking about the Shadow Collector, I'm talking about the Collector we see about 5 minutes before the events of For the Future's opening. Okay, now, if we're talking about characters staying consistent, we have to talk about Luz. In a good way, in a very good way. Just not for her. All of her anxieties and inner turmoil is still at the forefront of her character, and her talk with her mother is a really beautiful part of the episodes, and we finally see how the guilt and shame and despair that's been building within Luz since halfway through season 2 being released. It's a super cathartic moment that makes a lot of sense. You can go through all the fantasy adventures you like, but if you think your mother hates you for it, you'll never be the same. But more on that later. It's a treat to finally see Camila in the Boiling Isles, and I'm really happy they don't speedrun the generic fish out of water shenanigans, and her marrying Luz's first encounters is a really nice touch. All this said, you may be wondering why this episode isn't higher. No, you, you probably aren't, let's be honest, you know exactly why. It's because of the second half. I'm sorry, I'm sure they have their fans, but when you are ridiculously squeezed for time in your big three part finale, why spend a huge amount of time in one of those three parts focused on characters like Bosha, Kikimura and Matt Olimue? It would be like if one of the Avatar finale parts suddenly decided to spend most of its episode building on the characters of Sparky Sparky Boom Man and Judy, not for them to contribute to the final battle in any way of course. The Hexide section half of the episode, give or take, I'm sorry, just feels like a more nonsensical knockoff of Weird Mageddon. What with the post-apocalyptic take on characters being hunted by flying monsters and being taken to a castle in the sky, it's way too little way too late to add anything to Bosha, Matt was always just an okay character to me, and I probably like Kikimura more than most, but she really isn't relevant anymore. A destroyed Hexide and seeing what Kiki is up to aren't bad ideas, but when they take up half the episode's runtime, yeah, it really feels like the writers are just trying to keep our characters from Bellows and the Collector for as long as possible. For the future is a very mixed bag. But the highlights are so stinking high that they single handedly keep For the Future anywhere near lower than the middle of the list. And now we go from the future to the past. Look, truth be told, I've never been a big one for prequels. Unless they stand on their own as a complete story, 
as a setup mystery beforehand, or they are completely required to see for what is currently happening or what is going to happen in a story, I'd much rather focus on the present or future of a story than its past, you know? Before we get to that, we actually get a really awesome little scene of Luz experimenting with glyphs, showing her learning abilities that Bellos has, either in the past or the future, shown off. I wish we got more of this kind of thing, but I can understand being strapped for time. It's much easier to just put it at the start of the episode like this. Yeah, fair. Anyway, really awesome setup for Bellos' reveal. Now, enough just recapping the episodes, let's talk. Young Ida is just as much of a riot as older Ida, and her and Rain have some excellent chemistry throughout. I would honestly argue they have better chemistry than their older counterparts for the most part. Maybe that's just a side effect of them being young, and therefore brighter and more energetic, and a whole lot of their scenes together in the present day of the show are, how best to put it, very angst filled. But let's not jump ahead, we'll get there when we get there. The relationship between Ida and Rain is absolutely what carries the majority of the episodes. Lilith actually features shockingly little for what I was expected in a young Ida episode, and while it's really nice to see a younger bump, he ends up adding about as much to this story as he does the rest of the show. Just being a cool character, what can I say? And as for the rest of the younger cast, young Darius, Alador, Odalia, Willow's parents, I could honestly take or leave them. It's not like they do anything, or even say anything, so it's just kind of window dressing. And unless they're really pushing for a young Ida spin-off, I guess it makes the world feel smaller that all these characters went to school together, you know? Now, someone that's brand new, Principal Faust is absolute gold. Both in a less serious sense, his absolute despisation of children is truly commendable, I must say. And a more genuine serious sense because you can now see where Ida's complete hatred of the school system will have came from. A good teacher can make all the difference in the world to a kid's development, and someone like Ida being stuck with the worst of them all? Yeah, that would definitely develop into the woman we see today. Then there's the important part, the ending, which basically just showcases the big climax of season 2 in a blink and you'll miss it sheet of paper, and confirms that Rain is still part of the rebellion, as well as a hint towards Alador, which I feel like I'm saying this a lot, but, well, we'll talk about that later. Good episodes, but I feel like something flashback focused should have been a lot earlier in the season, personally. Willow's an interesting character, and I like that character a good amount. She's probably one of my favourites in the whole show. But when I'm asked why, my answer generally tends to be along the lines of, I just think she's neat. This episode though, it's taken a long while to get a dive into who she is, like three quarters of the way through season one, but it's a great first impression. And with some beta lumity along for the ride, who can say no? This is going to sound strange to say, but until the season finale, Understanding Willow has the best stakes of any Owl House episode so far. Which might sound strange to say, because our characters have been threatened with death, life in prison, slavery, and whatever the hell was going on with the old ladies in Once Upon a Swap, but obviously, when it comes to things like our characters' many close encounters with death, we know quite well they're going to make it out of this perfectly fine. Partly because it's an animated show on Disney, and because of the way the characters react. However, Willow losing her memories? There's no bodily harm involved, this is very different, and arguably even more terrifying. At least for a while, it's taken genuinely seriously by pretty much everyone involved, even Ida, slightly. Willow's mind is an incredible set piece, not because it goes all in on being grand and theatrical like I assume would be the usual case nowadays, it's actually surprisingly simple. The technical aspects are set up really well, and it's fascinating to imagine what other characters or minds are like. Then allows for the emotion to hit you hard by the second half. It's really great that they weren't immediately friends by the end. One good action just doesn't undo years of bad ones, especially when that good action only happened because of something bad the character was doing, and it's great that the show knows that. Oh, right, yeah, and I guess Gus is doing interviews or something. Yeah, I'll be honest, he honestly drags down the episode because Willow is set up to be his best friend from the start, and vice versa. And here he gets relegated to the comedy act when she's in mortal peril. 
The show's comedy feels a lot more natural once we get to season 2, and I'm glad it does because this is not it. But hey, it also is major setup for one of the best episodes in the entire show, so I can't argue too hard with that. <laughs> oh god, like I said, I feel bad for Gus in this series, in a meta sense, I mean. Because now, we have reached the second episode where he has given essentially the main character role, the A plot, and the B plot as a friggin' lumity kiss, so it's just a little overshadowed, you know? Okay, okay, okay. At the very least, you know, it's not a lie reveal episode again. Wait, no. No. Oh my god, it's a lie reveal episode again! No! <laughs> oh, Gus, you poor bastards. Okay, okay, let's actually talk about that quote-unquote B-plot first, shall we? Considering their next episode together they finally talk things out, this is the last full will-they-won't-they-blushy-blushy -blushy episode, and the writers know it. So, you know, they take the relationship between these two and dial it up to 11, and it's absolutely adorable! By the end, it's also incredibly emotional seeing these two confused and unsure about themselves and each other, and when they do finally talk to each other like this, it feels completely earned from everything they've gone through together, and how Amity has changed. But more on that later. And they're even given the ending of the episode with the introduction of the Echo Mouse. I love the design of this thing, the perfect combination of creepy and cute. Philip's journal, which, oh, we'll have plenty to talk about about there. And, oh, something I'm... Must, I must be forgetting something, hmm. Yeah, this was... How do I put it? Uh, then there's the main storyline with Gus, which is mixed. Him finally letting loose and showing off what illusions can do is a pretty terrifying, pretty amazing, pretty fucked up, woo, pretty sick sequence. But other than that, well, the Glandis kids are one off and one dimensional. The illusionist guardian has a good amount of potential, but never shows up again beyond a one off gag. And of course, for the second of two times that Gus is the focus of an episode, he's once again hiding behind a big secret that of course will be revealed by the end. Like, it's not bad, but it's not very good either, and ends up completely overshadowed by the much more interesting, much more emotional Lumity. F in the chats. <sighs> I'm not going to lie. This is the spot where the episodes really, really started to become difficult to rank. These next few, I was mixing and switching their positions for days on end, just in case one of your favourites comes up next. First of all, the cold open with Bellos and the Collector is a very hype scene. We don't get to see many interactions between these two, and this one, short as it is, does a great job of setting the stage for the big season 2 finale. The first half of the episode as a whole is easily where its strengths lie. The resistance meeting is very well done, and Ida being forced to get a coven sigil for the plan to work, despite, you know, the fact that she can't really use magic anymore, is still a very poignant moment for her character. Even if the plan itself is, um, interesting. Because from what we've seen, what the characters have seen, despite what they try to tell us, no, Ida's curse doesn't warp magic, it corrupts it. It makes it deadly. Like, the fact is, it was likely going to kill everyone caught in the effects in Ida's Requiem, more on that soon, was a big deal. That was a big deal. But that's not a deal breaker. And for what it's worth, I love the plan of the draining spell because it gives a genuine, clever way for our teenage cast to be as important as they are. Because obviously, they're not affected. That's cool. Now, okay, I put it off long enough. Let's talk about the reason literally everyone remembers this episode, shall we? It's not the emotional semi goodbye talk between our main trio. It's not the reunion between Luz and the Hexhead Squad now featuring Hunter TM. And it's most definitely not the battle with Kikimura and Odalia. No, it's this chunk of Lumity. So, hey, now is a good time to talk about the lead up to this kiss, eh? Back when it was first becoming clear that these two were going to get together, and by clear I mean I thought Lumity was the name of a character in the show because of how much I'd heard about it before watching, me and my friend who was watching the show separately were kind of concerned that this was going to be a big ol' 
rivals falling for each other instantly kind of thing. Since we knew this wasn't going to be a big well they won't they situation that tends to be stretched out throughout the entire show. But no, they're not even together at the end of the first season. And despite a gargantuan amount of relationship stuff, they don't even get a full on kiss until the end of season 2. Lumity is a great example of the best of both worlds in relationship writing, and showing just the right amount of restraint, and actually letting your characters be together. It's great stuff! All this to say, Clouds on the Horizon is a great episode even outside the Lumity stuff. There's the aforementioned first chunk, and even though I brushed past the fight with Kikimura, that has some great aspects to it. The twist and plan with losing Hunter, something that's really obvious in retrospect, but catches people off guard really well pretty much every time. The best kind of twists. And Gus doing the overpowered illusionist thing and just trapping Kikimura in complete darkness. And people say the animation in this episode is jank? Really? Outside of this little part, which I will defend till I die, I love it, I don't see why. And Willow about to beat down Kikimura remains one of my favourite pieces of animation in the entire show. I mentioned earlier that Odalia isn't particularly interesting when the stakes are lower, and the reverse is true. When the stakes are so high, her sheer arrogance and controlling nature become way more interesting and way more threatening just because of how self-destructive they are. It's realistic and interesting to see just how far people will go for good business. Whew, these are... These are getting longer and longer, huh? This may take a while. Alright, before anything else, I just have to emphasise that our first time meeting Hunter is pretty much shown that he was just scranning cereal in the dark during the journey, and I think that's just fucking brilliant Chad behaviour. Now, separate tides in an episode that's really tricky to place in the ranking, because there's a good amount of really, really good stuff in it, and stuff that just gets thrown to the wayside. By that, I mean, we spend half the episode with Hootie and Lilith, and it is not a bad time. Somehow, they take these two characters, who by this point in the show are probably around C tier for most people, and have them work off each other stupidly well. I really don't know how they did it. Lilith's flippant and maybe just a little pathetic, friendless self works wonders with Hootie's bizarre, manically upbeat demeanour, and the two bounce off each other with just the right shades of weirds. So it's not the characters I have a problem with, but rather what it is they're doing. See, they spend the entire episode breaking their backs, creating a potion that apparently allows them to see inside the Emperor's castle, wherever and whenever they like. I assume you understand just how stupidly broken that idea is, and it's pretty clear the writers did too, because it is never mentioned again. The new portal being built, the Collector, Bellos' curse, and everything else that goes on there. The Owl House gang should know exactly what's happening, and I guess they just never look? Even the quickest of throwaway lines over the next few episodes about how anti-scrying defences have been put up around the castle would have been absolutely fine. But it's just never addressed. Go figure. The rest of the episode though? That's pretty great. Confident Golden Card Hunter is a riot, and it's a shame we only really got like one more scene of him, which that wasn't even a thing because of the shortening. Not much else to say here, just a really fun character for now. Luz and Ida are definitely having less fun, and I really appreciate how they're both handled in this episode. In Ida's case, we've gotten to see her serious side before the finale, but here's where the two sides of her character are made very clear. Her carefree, cocky, jokester personality that's showcased with Lilith, and her more genuine side with Luz. Her talk with the kid is so heartfelt, you really understand how much of an impact these two have had on each other. Oh, and she's absolutely rocking that pirate fit, no wonder it makes a return for the epilogue. Then there's Luz. While she doesn't rock the same me hearties fit as much as her mentor, she's done even better in the character department. This is where we see her guilt twisting and manifesting into a spiral of self-loathing for the first, but most certainly not the last, time. Separate Tides does an excellent job establishing the new status quo, both for our characters' situations, 
but also for their mental state, something that's really important for what's to come. Good stuff. Honestly, I feel really bad not putting this any higher. For the fans of this episode, see it more like every episode above this being so utterly fantastic, rather than Labyrinth Runners being anywhere close to bad. Or even mediocre. Or even just good. Because this is a great episode. Adrian is a fun addition to the cast, his eccentric James Cameron-esque personality fitting in perfectly with the rest of the Emperor's Coven. Obviously there's not much depth to speak about, but the reactions of the scouts underneath them are some of my favourite reactions of the scouts in the series, and I love the scouts. But of course, there's so much more to talk about in this episode. Amity, Willow, Hunter, and Gus, my boy, look at you go! Third time's the charm! An episode focused on you without the lie reveal plot in sight! But yeah, in all seriousness, this is the best outing Gus gets throughout the entire series, easily. The over-the-top bullying and more childish insults being in his head is a really clever writing trick, and I'm glad we finally get to see some expansion on the fact that he was moved upgrades. And the connection that he builds with Hunter? Up till now Gus was just an okay character to me, and this episode single-handedly propelled him up much closer with the rest of the main cast. Speaking of Hunter, well, I'll talk about why he's one of my favourite characters soon, but in this episode specifically, he's... Low. It's debatable whether he was at a lower point here or in For the Future, but either way, he continues to be the best written character in the show. Not in terms of quality, not necessarily, maybe, but in consistency. There's no worrying about getting an interview for a school project when your best friend might be brain dead forever, for instance. There's clearly so much care in his character's actions. For example, him immediately going for an authority figure when trying to help Gus. Rock solid stuff all round. And, oh my god, I think the moment where Illusion Bellows turned the corner all of a sudden is probably the highest my heart rate has gone in this show. That's some amazing showcase of what Illusions can do. And then there's Willow and Amity. Ever since understanding Willow, they've had an awkward relationship. Which isn't a bad thing, it makes complete sense for both characters. But I think a full season later, now's a good time to wrap this up. And I think it's a shame we didn't get that much of this duo. But what we have here... It's some nice character building. This episode isn't without its issues, though. Like, I feel like Gussie's almost supernatural level of raw magical power just doesn't really come into play at all after this, let alone an explanation of it. Like, he's just a normal ass witch from this point on. Take Willow as an example. She's also shown to be a prodigy, and you're able to clearly see in many episodes across the series, especially in season 2, that that's the case. But when Gus is in combat afterwards, it feels like he could just be any other illusionist. It's admittedly going to be rather difficult to showcase illusion magic as being that notably powerful in comparison to just plants, but this episode seems to do that just fine. And after this, he even has that handy dandy magic amplifier, which might as well not even exist after it's introduced. I suppose he looks through Bellus' memories with it, but that has a range of its own issues and I'll address them in due time. All in all, great episode though.